So we really appreciate you coming in today. Uh, we have a great show to show you, uh, an amazing class here, and really don't want to take up too much time uh, before we let them demonstrate the skills they've learned in this training. Uh, really what I want to try to summarize are two things. The first thing is why you might want to be here. A lot of times I, I get that feedback if you don't explain why someone would want to be at a demo, then they sit there and go, why am I here, right? The first reason is um, if you look at our uh, training schedule or listen to their demonstration, you can hear about the project-based um, training that we offer at LHBU. And if you think about someone in your team that might need that, um, feel free to get a hold of us through LHPU.com or through Aaron Hartman or someone else at LHP and we can get your person lined up and put through the training. The, the second reason is um, obviously these, these people have the skill set necessary to control and run a diesel engine at the end of this class and they will be available for work on Monday. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure most of them are willing to go just about anywhere. Um, so there's no real travel restrictions at all. So uh, if you have any team needs in the resource area, that's why you have the resumes. Um, the second topic that I want to cover before I turn it over to the team is just kind of the advancements that LHPU has made um, through these, this four-year process and kind of where we're going from here. So um, one key advancement is the packet that you see at your desk. Again, Pam uh, was hired about three months ago and has made a tremendous impact to the organization of LHPU, as you can tell just by the organization of the packet and a description of what you're gonna go through today. Um, some other things uh, just to, to update you on are the classes that we're gonna be running in 2016. So um, we don't just have a six week diesel boot camp, we also have a six week gasoline boot camp. Um, and we have the negotiations, are they done yet, Dave, for the facility in Detroit? Or? Are we pretty close? The facility in Detroit? Is it done? Um, good question. Okay. <laughs> so in 2000... I got the final word that it's signed, sealed, and moved. So you can expect it, a facility in Detroit in 2016 where we're running the gasoline version. Um, once again, we did that uh, last year. The other thing is our powertrain calibration course, which we've partnered with SAE on, uh, that'll be rolled out in 2016. It's a one-week, uh, hands-on, project-based uh, powertrain where they calibrate um, an engine and they cal calibrate a transmission. So those are exciting classes. Uh, the, the last offering to talk about before I turn it over is the e-learning environment or what we call the remote training. So we are in development of the remote training. We have already recorded content. We already have the remote project. Um, and essentially what you can think about in terms of the e-learning environment is how do I get someone trained in this environment Maybe not as well with having a hands-on instructor every day, but they can learn the skills from a remote, remote location. So it cuts down on the, the amount of time they have to spend specifically on the project and allows them to continue working on their daily job. So those are the, those are the main updates, and now I'd like to turn it over to the team. Thank you, Zach. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ochuko, and I recently completed my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I am one of 14 team members that uh, recently completed the Fundamentals of Diesel Engine Controls course run by LHP. Um, so our objective of this course was to actually um, develop code in MATLAB and simulate code generation um, in order to successfully run a real-world diesel Cummins uh, 5.9 liter uh, engine with the VP44 fuel injection pump. Um, like I said, we're 14 engineers, we're from four different countries, uh, 12 different universities, and um, obviously there were some challenges that we had to overcome in terms of a language barrier, uh, different backgrounds, but we're able to effectively overcome all that, work together as an efficient team, and we're able to successfully complete our project. Um, so, like I said, there were some challenges, uh, one of which was the fact that the engine did break a uh, record number of times, which is four. Um, so yeah, but at the same time, it was a great experience because we also in increased knowledge of uh, testing and calibration and diagnostics as well. And we were able to fix all the problems um, with help from, of course, Rick and, and as well as uh, 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 an employee from Cummins. So that was a great experience as well. And as if all this wasn't enough, we actually do end up getting an SAE Certificate of Controls Mastery at the end of the course. So it's, it's just like piling on the, the greatness and awesomeness of this course. So I would just like to thank LHP for the opportunity um, and just acknowledge some of the partners without whom this course would not have been possible. 
Um, so this is a general overview of the presentation we'll be given today. Um, we'll first talk about the, the uh, kind of like an overview of the, the engine that we'll be working on, which is like I said, is the Cummins 5.9 liter diesel engine. And then we'll kind of go into uh, different aspects of our project, which include the sensors and the actuators, and as well as the controller that we actually built in order to run this uh, engine. And then we'll talk about the, uh, how we were able to send these messages and communicate with the engine through CAN. Um, J1939 in, in particular, as well as um, the Motorhawk block in, box in Simulink. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about how we're able to test and validate our uh, design uh, and our model that we built. So basically, verification is important because you don't want to um, break the engine again. Um, so, so we'll talk about kind of how we did that using DTE, and then we'll have a conclusion, and then um, we'll lead you out for some demos. So, Obviously, like I said, um, the objective was to successfully code uh, in MATLAB and Simulink in order to run an engine. So now I'll hand it over to Kavya, who's going to explain the working principle of the engine. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Hello, everyone. I'm Kavya Shri. I've done my master's in mechanical and aerospace engineering from University at Buffalo. As Uchiku said, yeah, running engine or controlling a diesel engine is our goal. That is what we had in mind when we came here. But initially, we wanted to know how this diesel engine would work like and what are the things we have to uh, control. So here is just a basic or typical how a model of six cylinder diesel engine look like. And here on the right side, we have how a single cylinder would be working. I assume that you all would be knowing that. But let me just give a quick overview on this where we intake uh, air and then we compress it and then we will be injecting the fuel at the right time and then uh, power produces which runs our engine and then the right thrust. So what are the things we exactly have to control is when to give the fueling, that is the timing and the amount of fueling we are supposed to give. This is, the, here we know what we have to do and here is how we are going to do the same thing. So basically a control system or complete model if you take which has two parts, one is the plan model and another one is the controller. So from the plan model we are sensing the data using sensors and our controller does all the mathematical calculations that we want to do and our actuator data is sent to the actuator which puts our plan model in action. So here are the data that we are sensing which is the engine speed and then the pedal position from the sensor, from the plant, and then we are calculating the amount of fuel that we have to calculate, that we have to give to the engine, and then the actuator does the job of lift pump and the timing of the fuel injection, and we are then calling the plant and saying that, hey, hello, here's my data, so do what the job you have to do. Um, but then this is not exactly what we started on. We wanted to know how exactly this would be working, or we just wanted to have a smaller project which would be telling us uh, what are we going to do later. So for that case, we uh, designed an electronic throttle controller, which would be explained by Sandeep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kavya, for giving the overview of the diesel engine control and also the sensor data and the actual data. Hello, everyone. My name is Sandeep. I'm currently pursuing my master's in mechanical engineering at University of Michigan, Diablo. Coming to the project, we know, actually explained, the sensors and electro actuators should work in a particular way. So we don't know how it works, so we have done a project named Electronic Throttle Control. So coming to its components, analog slider and the controller and the throttle body sensor. Coming to its working, the electronic controller will send a reference signal to the analog slider and the throttle body sensor. The analog slider, when it slides the, uh, the point pin, When you slide this analog slider, which is connected to a sensor, measures the position of the slider and it alters the signal to the ECM. The ECM collects the input data and it activates the throttle body motor and also the sensor of the throttle valve. Uh, the throttle valve, which is connected as a butterfly spindle valve, it measures the angle and gives the feedback to the controller. So the main function of the controller is to take the inputs from the analog slider and the throttle body and make sure that the, these two functions accordingly and how it is calibrated and what are the voltages to be converted will be explained by Manu. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Sandeep. My name is Manu. I'm a master's electrical graduate from uh, Colorado State University. What we see here is we need to read some data of these instruments and uh, 
It turns out that they operate on analog signals. Uh, these wiggles don't necessarily have to mean much. Uh, so modern electronics has a way to convert them to digital samples. And thanks to Motorhawk, we can uh, read them in really easy ADC counts, mathematical quantities that we can work with and uh, convert into engineering units. Now, in those units or ADCs, the pedal would be going from, say, 0 to 920. But this might not always be the case. Uh, sometimes we might have some manufacturing defects or something like the plastic limiting the position of the lever or the play of the lever. In those cases, we might want to change our operational ranges to, say, just this much between the blue lines. And this is what calibration is. We correct our, we make corrections to our readings and uh, we make corrections to the inputs that we have. And calibration is really important. Uh, this is just a simple case where we are retuning our operational ranges, but sometimes they're far more consequential. <laughs> uh, right. So the next part is coming back to our engine model. We're we'll going to be talking about sensors and Jingles, who is going to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Hello everybody, my name is Jingyuan, master's degree in electrical engineering from University of Illinois at Chicago. And I'll talk about sensor. As, as we know, we are, human, we are all human beings, we have feelings, machine has feelings too. Actually, they are alive. <laughs> and uh, I'll talk mainly about two sensors, uh, the pedal position sensor and the RPM sensor. Let's take, uh, take the pedal position sensor first. Well, I'll introduce about the, how we build the connection between the real sensor to our uh, model hawk model. And we, when we, get, we use this analog model to get it, the count, and we convert the counts, use gain and offsets to convert it to a scale of 100%. And it's better for us, to, convenient for us to, for the calculate. And here we go to the RPM sensor. Uh, before definition, we need to figure out how it works, how the encoder pattern works. And we go to the engine room, put the um, probes to the engine uh, signal, and we get the photo. Uh, and we see when there are 35 uh, single pulse, there's a gap. That's to say, there's a 36 minus one teeth uh, in the crank. Mm -hmm. So we get a, we know that there's, there's an angle in the intervals, and um, uh, divided by the duration, we can figure out exactly how many rotations per minute. That's where we definition here in this model to solve the uh, 30, 36 minus 1, the single tooth, and the rising range, the bingo, we got it up here. Uh, I'll hand over to Katie. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Katie. I'm going to talk about control strategy. Like, uh, I'll take an example of this presentation to explain how we did, how we did it. Like, when we know we have to present what we learned, we just didn't do it in one step. We did it in different stages. Like initially, we figured out what, who will do what, and then we uh, uh, did the slides, and we come. We we are doing it today now, and that we do it, did it in stages. In similar way, when we fuel our engine, it gradually starts um, giving fuel. Or sorry, it gradually speeds up. Like uh, the initial stage is like stall where the speed is set to be 0 to 100 and the next stage is crank the speed is set to be 100 to 600 and the next stage is run and, the, and this is the stage where we control the speed where we control a fuel with the speed and the pedal governor like if I keep on saying this presentation you guys get bored and you don't even understand what I'm going to say in similar way when we, if we keep fueling our engine it goes on speeding up and we don't want to blow up our engine again. So now we are limiting the speeds using max governor, ID governor and pedal governor. And this is being explained by uh, Suyog. Thank you. Thank you, Kirti. Hi, my name is Suyog. I'm a graduate student in electrical and computer engineering at Purdue School of Engineering at uh, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, I'm going to talk about the controller part. As explained by Kirti, there are three governors which are idle speed governor, high speed governor, and pedal governor. So, uh, like, how does a controller decide which governor to be activated? So, uh, if, if your RPM is below 1900 and you're not giving any throttle input, uh, 
uh, which is which which can also be below uh, two percent then your idle speed governor will be activated otherwise uh, it will go on to the high speed governor so uh, for idle speed governor we have set a limit of uh, 700 for idle speed and we are targeting our speed to 700 and uh, the throttle percentage is less than two percent and uh, we are achieving a smooth curve while accelerating and deaccelerating Yes, a symbolic model. Uh, you can see the idle management controller. Uh, here are some logic and mathematical equations in it. Uh, uh, the, this is a PI controller which just increment or decrement according uh, to the orders from idle management controller. Uh, it, it acts as a brain and this acts as a body part. So here's the graph. Uh, the yellow line is the actual speed, uh, target speed and the violet is the uh, actual speed and you can see that the curve is pretty smooth and we are achieving the target speed. Uh, the pedal governor is, uh, we are just relating APP with the fuel, uh, like if, if we are not using high speed governor or we are not using a idle speed governor, a pedal governor will be activated. Uh, this is a high speed governor which is identical to a, a idle speed governor, but the mathematical calculations and logic so here are different than uh, the idle speed governor. In this case, the RPM should be greater than 1600 and uh, your APP should, uh, should be greater than 2% and uh, we have PI to uh, increase or decrease the speed and set to 1700 RPM. Uh, you can see in the graph that from uh, the speed above 1500, it's uh, gradually increasing up to 1700 in a smooth curve with the yellow one as idle target speed and the violet one as uh, our, uh, our actual speed, what we got and the fuel consumption is good. So the next PI controller will be explained by Yin Chan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, my name is Yin Chan and uh, I graduated from University of Illinois at Chicago for my master's degree of electrical computer engineering. And I'm going to talk about the PI controller. So what's PI controller? PI controller is a control loop feedback mechanism controller trying to decrease the target speed and the actual speed, decrease the difference between them by adjusting the fuel injection. So what's that mean? So basically like uh, you're chasing girls and according to the girls' reaction to adjust your next uh, move. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it work? <laughs> so the PI controller continually calculates the error value. The error value go multiply the P gain to generate the P part, and the error goes to a uh, integral transfer function to generate the I part. By adding them together, you will know how much fuel you need. Let's go back to the story of the chasing girls. Okay, <laughs> this is you. This is a girl. This is the reaction. This is the current reaction, this is the experience you have. According to this two, you know what's the next move, <laughs> right? And uh, sometimes when the engine goes too high or too low, the integral part goes, goes to infinity. So we need, to, we need a signal to reset this part. So also we don't want to keep the engine, we need a reset value to keep the engine running. And uh, what this means, this means when the girl jumps you, you don't want to stay where you are, you want to move on. You go to the bar, you got a drunk, you wipe it out of the memory. <laughs> so you start a new life. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now we know how much. But it is a good application. Yeah, now we know how much fuel we need. But how to transfer this fuel? From the tank to the engine, I let my teammate Shamuga explain this for you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was a very good explanation and <laughs> comparison between the PI controller and the real life. And hello, I'm Shamuga. I'm a recent I'm recent graduate from Cleveland State University with a master's in electrical engineering. Up to now, we have uh, seen the specifications of the engine we are working on, the sensors and the controller output, which is the fuel, the calculated amount of fuel which is going to be given for the actuators. And 
this is our lift pump. I have to say something about this. This is the guy who created a lot of trouble for us and faced a lot of trouble from, a, from our faulty models. <laughs> and this is the overview of uh, the fuel management system. In motorcycles, we have the fuel tank on the top of the engine where we can use the gravity to uh, take the fuel from the tank into the engine. But in case of the cars and trucks, it's not going to happen. We cannot use gravity anymore. So we need something else. Here comes the lift, lift pump into action where it takes the fuel from the fuel tank and then pass it through the chassis filter and give it to the VP44. But it does, it also does a main function in keeping the low pressure, low pressure among the system up to uh, VP44. And uh, this is our uh, governor model where we have uh, initially found out the states where the engine is running, whether it is in stall state, crank or run. If it is in stall state, uh, we have given the duty cycle as 100% for the first two seconds just to prime, prime the pump to bleed the air bubbles outside and uh, send the clean fuel. And for the crank state, we have uh, we gave a 50% duty cycle and for run we maintained 100% duty cycle and uh, we maintained it low pressure at uh, 6 psi and the rest of the uh, things will be managed by the VP44 to pump the fuel uh, with the high pressure and that will be clearly explained by my teammate Tanvir. Thank you Shanuka for explaining the lift pump to us. Hello everyone, my name is Tanvir. I am a uh, master's student from Southern Illinois University and I graduated with a uh, degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, now I'm going to explain the VP44. And what it is, Shamuka just explained the lift pump, that is a low pressure pump, that just supplies fuel from the fuel tank to the fuel system. But the pressure is not enough so that we can uh, spray it inside the cylinder. So we need another high pressure pump, I mean the VP44, so that we can add in that high pressure and distribute the fuel inside the cylinder according to the proper firing order. So you can see it's a uh, VP44 from Bosch. There are six cylinders, so we have six outlets, and uh, that distributes the fuel inside the cylinder. So what it does, basically, it, uh, as I described, it uh, pressurizes the fuel, it distributes the fuel according to the firing order, and also it meters the fuel that we uh, uh, send by, by, by part, pulse. And uh, this is uh, what it looks like. The position of the pump in the engine is uh, on the left side, if you look from the flywheel side, and it is driven by camshaft. And uh, you can see the driving, driving shaft that is uh, uh, located just behind the timing uh, gear assembly. It is driven by uh, camshaft. And uh, it is a radial piston pump. It has solenoid valves at each outlet that we control uh, the outlet of the fuel. And this is a distributive style. And uh, almost in all the pumps, there are built-in ACL that communicates with the main issue of the engine using CAN communications. That is the overview of the VP44 and the rest of uh, the pump, I mean, uh, how it is controlled and uh, what we did will be explained by others. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tanvir. Uh, hi, my name is Ajay and uh, I'm from Arizona State University. I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, now, going back to the governor. From the governor, we learned how much fuel we need uh, for control to happen. Uh, but the question arises, when do we supply this fuel between the cylinders? How do we inject and how do we time? Uh, this uh, this g gives us a cue to the VP44. Uh, this is the VP44 and the signals it re uh, receives. And uh, the signal that is of specific interest to us is the engine position reference signal. What is this signal? It looks like this. Uh, each of these waveforms is an individual uh, firing event in the engine. Uh, there are three of these waveforms in a rotation of uh, 360 degree and 6 and 720 degrees. And this little dip here corresponds to the engine firing event, which is approximately around uh, 10 degrees after top dead center. And uh, we are going to, we are to, uh, to help inject and time, we need to build this signal all over again. And how do we do it using the Motorhawk blocks? Uh, we have something called as the Motorhawk Dual PSP. Uh, we use this for injection and timing. Uh, there is another challenge. Uh, there are going to be only three pins on our ECM board. Uh, that can be used to fire our engine, but we have six cylinders on the engine. So what the dual PSP does is it creates two, uh, two pulses which can be offset by 120 degrees and uh, this helps us time the engine. 
So we given our engine uh, offsets of 120 degrees. Uh, we give the start of injection and the injection duration, and this helps us time. Now, uh, how do we let the VP44 know how much fuel we need to get? Uh, I'm going to uh, ask Siddhartha to explain about can communication. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. Now we have looked at uh, the sensors, controllers, and actuators. So we need some communication to send the control commands from the controller to the VP44 pump. So we have used the controller area network, which allows the microcontroller to talk with the devices in a network. We have a very few devices. The point-to-point -point wiring is a cost-effective device, but if you have more number of electronic devices in a system, the system becomes very complex. So the CAN is used to overcome this complexity with additional benefits. So we have a error checking mechanism which we can implement in the CAN. We can assign the priorities to our messages. We can send the broadcast communication to the entire nodes, and, we, and the complexity also reduces. And the BMW 8 series is the first car in which the CAN protocol was implemented. And this is the diagram which shows how the canvas looks. We have our nodes which are connected parallelly. And the canvas signal is represented by the difference between the CAN high and CAN low signal. So if we have any interferences coming from the external disturbances, it affects both the signals, so the effective difference still remains the same. So there is, that is why we use a differential signaling for this communication. And we can also use a shielding to still avoid the external disturbances. This is the cable which we use for our electronic throttle control project, which has a proper shielding. And moving on to J1939, it is a specification which tells how we need to implement our CAN protocol. It, we can ha assume that the CAN is a telephone wire network, where the J1939 is a language spoken onto the telephone networks. And it allows maximum 30 nodes which can be there and with, with 40 meters as the maximum length and it works on 250 kbps length. And this is a picture which shows the CAN, CAN frame. We have a start of files, we have an identifier which we can have a source address, destination address and priorities. We have a data field where our actual data goes in and we have a cyclic redundancy checks which, which we use to check the errors and we have an acknowledgements and end of files. Now we'll see how we actually send our CAN messages, which will be explained by Shashi. Thank you. Thanks, Siddha. Uh, first, I need to thank you for your time and patience. Uh, well, I am Shashi Dharan. I did my master's in mechanical engineering from the University of Toledo. So today, I'm here to talk about the CAN messages. Uh, in this presentation, we'll be seeing uh, how and what and how to send in a CAN bus. So as I said, so we will be sending some information about the fuel, some information about the cam timing, some information about the ignition, and uh, some information about the synchronization. Um, to, to make it simpler, uh, just for understanding purpose, uh, in real world, we have different languages. So each language is differentiated from the other by using a set of rules. Similarly, we need to differentiate the information. Similarly, we need to differentiate the information of fuel from the cam timing. So we do it by using PGNs with the help of SAE standard J1939. And one more thing is that in CAN bus, we, uh, we used to have many messages. So out of that, some are critically important and some are uh, not, 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 that much not that much important. So we need to prior prioritize the critically important messages. Otherwise, we will be ending up like this. In this picture, you'll be seeing that the person gives more importance to the camera than his child. So it clearly <laughs> shows that he doesn't have any priority. <laughs> priorities. So, so we need to give priorities, uh, and SAE J1939 helps us to give priorities, and this is how a prioritized message looks from the less important messages. So this is the motor hook can send block. Uh, so we'll be giving information about start bit value, offset, uh, bit line, by using MATLAB script. Uh, and we should make a note that J1939 uses Little Indian format. So by this time, uh, we assumed that we have collected necessary information to build up a model. So we went ahead and built up, uh, we, so we went ahead and built our model. And just like in a real world scenario, model should be tested before it is being into production. And my friend Samant will be talking about the testing procedures. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Samant. Uh, I'm a master's graduate in electrical and computer engineering from uh, Indiana University, Purdue Indi uh, University, Indianapolis. So right now, I'm going to talk about uh, DTE and conclusion. 
uh, once our model is built and ready, our model is ready and we, we need to test it somewhere before testing it on the engine. So uh, we have a platform, a uh, desktop testing environment where we built our model and where we built the model which we built, we tested on this. Uh, uh, it, did, it didn't matter with us, even though it was a safer environment, we broke the engine several times. Mm -hmm. We gave it a hard time. So, yeah, what basically desktop environment uh, is, uh, it is hardware in loop testing, uh, where you get uh, different, where you get uh, a replica of an engine. So, uh, the model which we have generates signals which is similar to the engine, Cummins engine which we have. So, and our model, by, uh, by which we can verify our model. So, this is basically done by DTE. So, once we are done with DTE, uh, uh, I, I want to conclude this presentation. So, uh, after, uh, before coming to this LHP, uh, we were like confused, what are we going to learn? We just had a clarity that we are going to run a diesel engine, but we don't know how we are going to do that exactly. So, uh, there were several series of steps which are uh, given by LHP and there were several requirement and design things which are given by LHP and they were very so so uh, on target that uh, we were able to understand uh, each and everything in proper because we had uh, different teams at different times so uh, we were able to build a team uh, we were able to act as act as a team in each and every point of the time so uh, first thing we, which we did was we uh, did the requirement analysis and tried to design how uh, the model should look like and then one more important thing which we did was documentation issue tracking. So whenever we built a model, I, as I previously mentioned, we changed uh, teams at each and every point of time. So uh, the, the thing was uh, we were not able to discuss previous team model with other teams. So uh, this, this uh, document analysis and issue tracking helped us in that thing so we were able to we even though we were in the point of in the middle of uh, building our model uh, we were building it from scratch in each and every point of time so this helped us a lot so and after the building of the thing we were doing integration testing and we had uh, a, re a regular team <coughs> meeting and lunches which helped us you know become more as a team say uh, we became as a team uh, by the end of uh, the course so, Hi, my name is Sanjeev. I'm here to explain about the remotely controlled electronic throttle control. I'll relate my experience with you. Uh, at an age of 16, I've been driving my car, I'm uh, pressing my pedal, and the car goes away, increasing the RPM. I don't know what the control strategy is doing in my vehicle and how the engine is going there. So, while, after coming to LHPU, I came to know that okay, there is a control strategy within the pedal and also the throttle which is present in the car to control it. So, we have done a project with the sensors and the actuators which is related to our, my vehicle. So this is an accelerated pedal when we compare it to a car and here is an input of 0 to 100. So when we are at a 0 stage, the accelerator is at here and the throttle accelerator uh, doesn't allow any amount of air into the engine. So when we press the pedal, it has an accelerated pedal sensor which sensors the position of the pedal and gives the signal to the electronic control module. The electronic control module takes the position from the sensor and it actuates the throttle motor which controls the butterfly spindle valve which is present on the throttle body and allows the amount of air entering into the body which is connected to the engine output and the power. So what does ECM do? ECM helps out to connect this axial pedal position on the throttle body so that the required amount of pedal position on the throttle body butterfly spindle valve opening should be done accordingly. And how we converted this pedal position to the ECM and ECM how it manages the throttle bar. PCM contains an electronic sensor which has a potentiometer which also works on voltage divider. So it has a V voltage reference to the ground and also V reference. As I said, the ECM sensor reference voltage to the pedal sensor. So when you press the pedal, it alters the voltage and sends the signal back to the ECM. So the ECM collects the output voltage and sends back to the throttle to Control the throttle valve. The throttle valve, which, which is open and measures the angle and is sent back to the ECM. So, ECM is the main part which helps us to understand how the pedal position of throttle actually works. And what are the mechanism going through it and how we are controlling the ECM with this, we will explain by Chitra. Now, we will see how we actually develop our model. This is an instructor model and this is a student model. Our instructor has challenged, challenged us to build our own instructor model. I think we have successfully developed our instructor model. So, we have a pedal position. This is an analog 
analog sensor which is represents the gas pedal in our car. So this is, this is the potentiometer. So when we change the resistance, the voltage, effective voltage changes. So when we send the voltage, the ECU receives the voltage and it converts it into counts using a MATLAB analog input input clock. So we simultaneously read in the throttle sensor positions also and we convert it into counts here. So now we have the sensors information to us. So we need to send it to a controller which is at the remote location. So we have used a CAN bus to send our information. And before that we need to make sure the send CAN block here and the receive CAN block at the remote location should have the same offset and scale values to actually decode the same same data. So we have, we have used the canvas to send our information. So this is a controller which receives the input data. The CAN read block decodes all the data and we have given it to a PI controller which controls it and we have given a duty cycle to, our, to the CAN bus again to give it to the EC, ECU again here and this ECU collects that and gives the throttle which controls it. Uh, Sandeep and Siddhartha clearly explained uh, why it is working and what's inside it. Now let's see how it works. As they said, uh, this is an ac accelerator pedal position. When we move the accelerator position, pedal position, it sends the signal, as they said, and uh, it's going to change the throttle position. And to calculate this, we have used motor tune, and uh, we are sending the messages using uh, uh, we are sending a messages using CAN log files and these CAN log files can be viewed using the CAN King software. This is the open loop control. This is a closed loop control. So you can actually see these files are tracking our sensor here. You can back the position of that. Problem. Yeah, actually yeah. that Throttle position sensors gives feedback to the ECM. So ECM makes use the actual position and the desired position right. and it calculates the error and gives back the appropriate signal to the throttle to work accordingly. So the main control part is located at the different remote location. So the input sensor parts are calculated here. And we can look, it tracks the data here. And the red one is the ATT sensor pedal position and the green one is the throttle position. So it's nice to track the position. Hello everyone, uh, today we are going to talk about uh, DTE, which is desktop environment. Once we have a model built, we need uh, a safer environment to test our model. So we have this model built by LHP. Uh, so what basically DTE is, uh, it is an NI hardware where it, gen it generates similar signals that has a Cummins engine inside. Uh, so that's how a desktop uh, engine, a desktop and looks and uh, the working of it will be explained by Suryo. Hi, uh, you can see the display of an engine, uh, here's the RPM and here's the top. Uh, right now the key is on, it's just the battery on position and you can see the voltage which is above 12 volts and uh, I'm right now going to start the engine. You can see the RPM goes to 700 and uh, the idle speed governor uh, comes uh, into the picture and it keeps the RPM at 700 because you are not giving any APP, uh, the APP is 0. So as uh, you can also see the value as 700 uh, which fluctuates sometimes uh, between 699 and 700. Uh, so our PI controller tries to keep it at 700 for idle speed governor. So I'm, right now I am giving my uh, APP to 25%. Uh, you can see that our engine RPM goes to 1700. Uh, and here is the value which is going up to 1699 to 1701 and our um, high speed governor is trying to pull the value to 1700. So uh, you can see that uh, I have not given much APP, uh, it's just 25%. So it's too sensitive. I can reduce the gain, APP gain and make it less sensitive so that it gradually increases to 7, 1700. I can show you that. Right now the APP gains are 1. I will reduce it to 0 0.25.
I'm not giving any APP right now, it's zero, zero percent. You can see the RPM coming down to 700. And now I'm giving back my APP to 25 percent. You can see that it's increasing slowly. It's not going rapidly so that it, it achieves a, a RPM of 1700 gradually. Now you can, you can see that it's running properly as we desired. But initially, when we designed our model, and we have we, all, we designed it according to the engine specifications, but uh, we couldn't know, run it here. Like we had a few problems initially. We didn't know what is happening. Lately, we figured out that uh, the problem was it couldn't take the fan message because this fan message priority is different from that mesh engine priority. So this was four and that is six. So later we figured it out and we could run it slowly. And figuring figuring that out, we thought it is okay. We're gonna run it and get our output. But there is another problem, and that was uh, uh, that was the crank angle offset. So uh, the DDU is is a little more stringent. Uh, when you go onto the engine, you just have to set your cranks to a positive. 120 degrees. Uh, the physical quantities on the engine, the signals are always positive, uh, but the DTU took in a negative 120 degrees offset. The negative uh, stands for uh, after top dead center. So uh, the whole demonstration highlights the fact and advantages of using a hardware in loop uh, system. Uh, one of the uh, one of the advantages it has is it, it reduces the cost of experimentation. Uh, and test equipment drastically. Uh, you can sit at a remote location and still get your uh, plant sensors working and uh, uh, you can test your embedded control system that you have implemented sitting at your desktop. Uh, one other thing is that the, this is a computer. It, it, it is basically robust. Uh, consider the fact that you just didn't test on the DT and went directly onto the engine. Uh, there are concerns about safety. Uh, there are concerns about the reproducibility and the precision of the engine. You might not get the same result every time because there's a lot of friction parts and there's a, and there's a lot, of, lot of unwanted signals in the engine. Uh, the plan model in this DT takes care of that. Uh, so it is robust, it is precise, and uh, it, it also simulates safe conditions uh, for us to test our controls on. Hello everyone, welcome to the engine demo. I'm Kaveshri, this is Manu. We will be just showing you everything in action. I think you guys are pretty much tired listening to so much of blabbering. So let's just get to the action. <laughs> so it's just started the engine. This is my can. It just started communicating. Here is the engine working. So this is our. Let me just show you something in more gear where we have red, this is our engine speed right now and this green line will tell us the maximum target that we have set and the blue line will tell us the ideal speed we have set since I think you guys have heard that idle speed we are setting it at 700 so our engine is working pretty good where it's maintaining that 700 and anyone would like to press the pedal and see how our engine is right. working you want to break this one? <laughs> That's really who you want to touch you with the Probably not. Yeah, we had a calibration. Alright, here we go. Of course, he didn't want to do what he was told to do. He's never. You're changing idle governor's speed? Yeah. Uh, since we said the uh, final is crank, we didn't, we didn't tune it at 500, did we? Yeah, we said like, but uh, only the run activates after six, 600 uh, because yeah. till 600 it's crank. Fast response. All right. See the pedal. Does your higher idle governor work? Yeah. Well, you're about to find out. Maximum governor is in action.
should go. Very nice. Hi. I think this will be looking pretty simple, but this was not our journey for the six weeks. We did overcome a few of the problems. We, we all know what it takes to actually make this Wait, <laughs> and one of the key uh, takeaways that we had was trying to find the problem. Because it just stops and we're sitting here and I have to go through the wires. And I think the first step is that we not was trying to identify if it's an electrical problem or a mechanical problem. So that way we can uh, sort of have a starting point. And then we did do that and we found out that we broke up the fuses, which we then replaced. I think they're going for five mechanical failures per session. <laughs> <laughs> we have the record so far, so... At least we didn't do the same thing over and over again, because we had some... Yeah, different problems. Yeah, each time. different problems each time. So you're bumping in and out of something there, right? There's some delay in the system, because we are controlling using this. Did you change oh, the okay. games? Yeah, this is... So that we get the, this is our idle we are saying, so that our transition is smoother. Yeah, I understand. I'm wondering why, but this so it settles out after a while. It's got a little bit of oscillation there. Yeah. And also, they, since there's some delay between the system, it's taking some time to work. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Get your hands dirty. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 